Today, I will show you the most amazing automation best practices to help you succeed in test automation, all while taking a bad test and turning it into an amazing one through a refactoring process. Let's talk about some best practices for test case design. One of the key things I want you to always be thinking about, by the way, I'm, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Bo Uncle Bob, but Uncle Bob is a wonderful software developer. He's been developing software since like the 1950s. So he is a very knowledgeable, knows, knows the stuff. He's one of the creators of Agile. Uh, he's written multiple books on uh, so books such as clean code and clean architecture on how to make sure that your software behaves well, behaves well. And he states that duplication is the primary enemy of a well-designed system. So a lot of these patterns that I'm about to show you, that I'm about to talk about, they are based on a removing duplication from our test automation. We always want to be focusing on removing duplication. Now, we don't want to remove too much duplication where something becomes extremely hard to read because so much duplication is removed, but a lot of it is basically just duplication removal. I'll talk about those examples. Page objects is one of those techniques developed to help us remove duplication, create abstraction so that whenever our code changes, we only have to update it in a single place. A page object is a concept that has been developed over many years. It's probably been around since at least 2004, 2005, when Selenium came out. And this page object pattern basically tells us to encapsulate or abstract an HTML page into an actual class in our code. So in this case here, you can see that we have a SAUS demo login page class that represents the saucedemo.com website on the right hand side. You can also see that we have all the element locators inside of this class so that will allow us to interact with the elements. And you also see that we have methods that a user, end user, not a test person, but an end user will perform on our web application. The reason why I say that is because it's important to remember that we want to represent our page objects in the way users will interact with them, not in the way that uh, Selenium or any kind of other automation framework will interact with them. And again, the whole point of this is that everything lives in a single place. Um, it redu reduces duplication, improves maintainability, and pretty much does everything here. It, uh, it also does improve organization because let's say, for example, you want to make an update to the sauce demo login page and some uh, update happens in the HTML, you go to a single class, you update everything in a single class and then you are done versus having, for example, a giant class that contains all the locators and all of the methods. Now, if something changes, I guess you can go to that class and change it there, but you can also break many other things. If they're dependent upon each other, you can even break that entire class so that now it no longer compiles. And now you've ruined uh, automation for everybody using that class. So with all of that said, I'd like to play another game with you where we're going to play a game called good or bad page object. I want to see now based on everything you've heard from me, and I'm sure you took fantastic notes, whether you think this is a good or a bad page object. Simply look at this class and tell me, write it down, think about it, whether this is a good or a bad page object. Don't worry about the implementation details. For example, don't worry about whether someone is using an ID or a class to identify an element. That's not what we're talking about here. Those are code implementation details. Look at the page object overall. Think about it. Does, it. does this page object seem like something you would understand that you would want to use in your test code? Now, I hope that you said that this is a good page object because this is one of the best page objects that could be. One of the reasons is the best is because I've written it. No, I'm totally kidding. Um, I did write it, but I'm very objective with my code. And it's that's not one of why this page object is good. This page object is good because number one, it has a really good name. Uh, when you look at this page object, sauce demo login page, you know exactly 
what this kind of tests, right? You may not know what the sauce demo page is, but you do know it's a login page, right? So right away, okay, you know, this is a representation of some login page. Then you see that it has locators. The locators live in a single place relevant to that page object. That's excellent. And then you see methods that seem to belong to this page object, a method like open and a method like login, right? Login method belonging in a login page. How crazy of an idea, right? So that's why it's a good page object because it is small, it's simple, it has a great name and it has properties and methods that represent how a user would interact with that login page. How about this one? Good or bad page object? Now, in this case, I hope that you said that this was a bad page object. The reason why this is a bad page object is because none of us looking at this code will ever know which page it's actually testing. First, it doesn't even have a name, but second, there are no methods. There are only locators. So if anything, it's not really a page object. It's more of like a object repository, but where are all the methods to interact with this page? Are they, do they live in a separate class? Where is that class? What is that class called? How do we use that class? These are all questions that come up right away when we look at this class and try to use it. So this one is a bad one. How about this one here? Good or bad page object? This one maybe could, will come as a surprise, but this one is actually also good as well. If you listen to me previously and you are familiar with page objects, this one meets all the criteria that we've talked about before. First, it has a good name, shopping cart component. Next, you see that it has elements that are relevant to the page object, and it has methods that would, that seem like they belong in this class. So items and cart is one of the methods based on the shopping cart component. So the reason why I put this up here is to convey the point that page object pattern, even though it's named that it's a little bit of a poor name because a page object doesn't necessarily have to represent an entire HTML page. In fact, a page object can represent a small component of a page. And so in that case, usually we name it something like shopping cart component, right? And so you can imagine in an e-commerce site, there's a shopping cart that always lives in our header. And we want to reuse the shopping cart in all of our page objects. And so in that case, we would create a new class called the shopping cart component the shopping cart component would perform all of the actions and store all of the properties that we want related to the shopping cart. And we would use it everywhere. Even the header as well, for example, the header, it lives on all of our pages. So rather than all of the pages constantly storing all of the properties, we create a header class. We can call it a header component or a header page object or something like that. And then that will encapsulate all of the things that are relevant to the header. Again, removing duplication so that we can reuse that in all of our classes and then maintainability and readability all become better. Now, one other thing I strongly want to talk about about page objects is the anti patterns. We talk about the patterns a lot, but we don't talk about the anti patterns enough. And it's unfortunate because I actually see these anti patterns happening all the time still. And it's really critical to get all of this correct because if you're not writing page objects correctly, your automation is bound to fail. So some page object anti patterns are overpopulating the base page. Now, don't forget that a base page is a common place uh, for components of all the pages, not just like five pages out of 10 that you found need some repeated functionality. Now is not the time to put that in a base page because if another class tries to use it, that doesn't care about that method or property, that method or property will be available to that class. And then it will try to use it. And then something weird might happen. The, 
or you might get some exception or you got, might get some weird interaction. And that's the kind of stuff that you want to avoid. It actually falls back to the Liskov substitution principle. If you're familiar with the solid principles, if not, go read about it and then this will make sense. And also one other thing I wanted to say is that keep your base page objects to 200 lines of code max. We found that this works really well. It's a very simple rule of thumb that will make sure that your page objects, not only the base page, but all of the, your classes will be more maintainable. They will follow the single responsibility principle. They'd be more readable as well. It's just a very easy way rather than kind of thinking about all the possible patterns that you can apply to a class. Just remember 200 lines of code max. If it's starting to exceed that, I might need to extract some classes out to make things more component, component, more compartmental and reusable and maintainable. By the way, some things that you can throw into a base page that what all the pages are used are like the driver, maybe the JavaScript executor, maybe even the web driver weight class that will allow you to synchronize in all of the elements. Those are some of the common components that belong in the base page. With that said, you can also overpopulate the page object as well. This is basically just talks about premature automation because a lot of us, what we'll do sometimes is we will start our automation positions and we'll realize that, oh, here I have a login page. I'm going to be interacting with this login page. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a class that represents this login page and I'm going to capture all the properties and all of the methods of this login page before I've even written a test or maybe before I've even written several tests. And so what that ultimately does is you waste a lot of time and effort writing these page objects. And then it's very possible that you may never use the, all the methods and properties of that page object. And so then there are a lot of unused methods, a lot of unused properties that are sitting in your class that you wasted time identifying that you'd never use. It's just a wasted effort, premature automation. So my recommendation is that basically write your test case and let the test case drive the development of your classes. As you develop the test, the test will tell us which page objects we need and which methods we need as well. Finally, my third point about anti-patterns is make sure that your page objects represent only the behaviors that an end user would make on that HTML page or component or element or something like that. Okay. So some things that end users are not performing and with our page objects are opening Excel files or connecting to SQL or converting strings to array. They're not doing that kind of stuff. So that should not be public and exposed in your page object. Nobody should be allowed to perform any of these operations in a test method. If a user can't do it on your HTML page, your page object better not be able to do it in a test case. You can use these things to help you in your page objects, but make sure that your test case can never perform one of these actions. Music